Okay, my friends. So we have said that in the previous hour, we have mentioned that object-oriented programming is a philosophy which uses uh, the classes and the objects generated from these classes, user-defined classes, and the objects generated from these user-defined classes as building blocks or the foundation uh, of coding. And it has some uh, aspects, this philosophy has some aspects which will make our lives easier. That aspects are going to relate the objects or the classes with each other. Okay, if you relate the classes with, uh, the, with each other, then the objects generated from these classes will also be indirectly related from this uh, uh, relation. Okay, they are going to be related with each other. Therefore, when we are coding or classes, we need to be relating these classes with each other. And these relations are mentioned under the names of composition, inheritance, and association. There are several aspects here. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to teach all of them, but I will be teaching the main of them, which are going to be important for us. So composition means what? Composition refers to one class being composed of instances from other classes. Actually, you have already seen about this, right? When we have developed the user-defined class car, we have defined four attributes for that, right? Brand, model, year, and uh, odometer, right? There were four attributes there. So brand was a string, model was a string, year and odometer, they were integers, right? They were taking integer values. So you see the attributes of cars generated from the car class, they are having attributes from other classes, like strings or integers, okay? So the attribute of one, the attribute of an instance generated from one class can be another object generated from another class, as you can see, okay? So composition refers to that. We can expand this idea and we can develop, for example, two classes. The at One of the attributes of one class or the objects generated from that class can be assigned with an object generated from the other class, okay? So the attributes that we have mentioned uh, about the objects that we have created so far, we have mentioned about dog, right? We have developed a class that is called dog. We have also developed a class that is called car. Uh, for dogs, we have mentioned about the name attribute. We have said that it must have a name attribute and it must have an age attribute. And for cars, we have said that it must have brand, model, year, and the odometer attribute. These attributes were assigned with values from built-in classes, okay? The objects generated from built-in classes, such as strings or integers or slots. However, are we limited to the built-in type of objects to define the attributes? No. We can create a class. From that class, we can generate an object, and we can take that object and assign it as an attribute to another object generated from another class, okay? The idea is called composition, my friends, okay? Composition. So why do we do that? Because in reality, in reality, objects are composed of smaller objects, right? In real life, what we see is this. Imagine a game. Actually, at this point, do not imagine a game. At this point, imagine a real city, okay? Not a simulated one. Imagine a real city, okay? A real city has different attributes, such as the population, okay? Population or the size of the population. But we do not need to say size, right? But when we say population, we understand basically how many people are living in that city, okay? A city has a size of the population and every city has a mayor, right? So we can say that the, we can indicate this mayor of a city by a simple string, okay? So by, by writing a simple string, we can actually define who is the mayor or the size of the population can easily be indicated with an object from the integer class, right? When we say, for example, 20 million, when we say 20 million, we understand that size of the population of that city is equal to 20 million, 
Okay, but every city have other attributes as well. In, in, now we are talking about uh, different built-in data types in Python here. Okay, the Meyer name can be assigned with a string object, or the population size can be assigned with an integer object. However, every city is composed of different type of objects, right? In every city, we have hospitals. In every city, almost in every city, not in every city, but we have universities, we have schools, right? In every city. We may have libraries. We have people in every city. In some cities, we have rivers. In some cities, we do not have rivers, okay? In some cities, we have bridges. In some cities, we do not have bridges. In some cities, we have roads, which are basically related with each other, right? So in the end of one road, you start to walk another road. So a city is a very, very sophisticated object, which is composed of other type of sophisticated objects. And these sophisticated objects can be composed of other type of sophisticated objects. But I mean, as we go down in the higher uh, hierarchy, here, so at the bottom level here, uh, the objects are going to get simpler and simpler, okay? Now, for example, a mayor is another object. So when, instead of simply writing a name with the string class from the string class as the attribute to the city, you can define a mayor as a human being, okay, as a human being. And in that human being object, you can define his or her name, his or her uh, citizenship ID, and maybe the uh, political party that the mayor is a member of. Okay, maybe from that. I mean, you do not need to speak about the other attributes about the mayor, but you can also define the mayor as another object instead of using his or her name from the string class. Okay, so you see, a sophisticated object from a sophisticated class may have other attributes which, which are instances generated from user-defined classes, okay? So we, if we are going to define a hospital attribute to the city, that hospital attribute should be an instance generated from the hospital class, which will be a user-defined class again, because there is no built-in type of class that we know of, like dictionaries, lists, or sets which are not going to be good representations for hospitals, right? We will not be able to represent a hospital by using these built-in type of classes. Instead, we need to define our user-defined class hospital and generate hospital objects from that. And these objects should be assigned as an attribute to the objects from the city class. Like that, we can define a class that is called university and from that class we can generate university objects and these objects can be assigned as an attribute to the city objects generated from the city class okay can now, i ask it, something yes dina you can ask is this similar to importing like like the concept of it is it similar to like importing, for example, here we said we will define university class and use some attribute to another program? Not, not exactly. Importing importing is a very, very tangible operation like uh, transferring. Okay, transferring. So we are not transferring the properties of a hospital to a city here. So there will be in the hospital class, there will be some attributes and class uh, methods which are defined especially for hospitals. We are not importing these methods or <coughs> attributes to a city. We are just generating an object here and we are assigning this object as an attribute to the city. Okay? And just, okay. Like, just like a string can be an attribute to an object, Okay, just like a string can be an attribute to an object or an integer can be an attribute to an object, a user defined, a, an object generated from a user defined class can also be assigned as an attribute. So we are talking about this only. So uh, we cannot say that this is similar to import because import is actually a tangible operation. I mean, when you import the objects from one module to here, in this module, they are going to be available for use. Okay, so this yes. is not, we are not speaking about importing here. We are basically uh, relating one object 
with another object okay for example okay. your arm is a part of you your arm is a part of you arm is an object and a human is another object and arm is an attribute to the human because arm has its own functionalities defined for itself okay uh, you cannot simply define a single class like city and define everything in it without defining such classes which are going to generate uh, objects as an attribute to the city okay you can simply I write understood. A, if you simply write a single class like city and define everything related to hospitals and universities and schools inside the city object in, inside the city class then the city class will be obviously too complex okay so we are trying yes. to remove this complexity by using the real life concept of composition. We say that a city is composed of other objects which should be for which we should also call uh, we should code classes. Okay. For example, a university is also a sophisticated object. If we are going to write a class that is called university, we shouldn't write a single class that tries to code everything in it. Instead, we need to say that a university is composed of a campus, a few faculties, right? So we need to say that faculty should be coded as a class, okay? And inside the faculty class, we should also define the uh, some attributes as departments, and these departments should also be objects generated from the department class, okay? Okay. Did you understand this? So basically, yes, but it's very complex. Like it's very at this point. I mean, at this point in reality, it's, you, it's you are infinite. not going like to... when you think of it as a concept, yeah, it's you infinite, can instantly define. You need to step at a point. You you need to stop at a point where it is not. It's becoming unnecessary. Okay. For example, yes. For your, I mean, I imagine what is my objective? I want to create a simulated city, right? I want to create a simulated city. I mean, in, imagine in a game. Who cares how many faculties do we have in the university that we built in the simulated city game? We are just going to simply build a university and that university will only have some capacity of students in it. Okay, some capacity in it and nothing else. I mean, if you ever have played a game about the simulation games, city simulation games, I mean, I, I have played years ago, okay? I'm still playing, but uh, not this kind of games anymore. <laughs> Okay, you just take a university object from the menu and you build it. And when you click on it, it only has a capacity which you can change the capacity of the students. And you can only increase it up to a certain level. I mean, the university, if you want to open another university, you can open another university in it. But there was only a single attribute on it. Now, you are you shouldn't forget about the main objective of the program or objective of the program is to create a simulated city so the university object the university class that we are going to develop there should not have any attributes which are of other classes did you understand it yes okay but if you think like a god Okay, if you're trying to become a god here, there is no limitation. Every faculty has members. Every member is a human being. Every human being has lungs. Every lungs <laughs> have some uh, tissue in it. Tissues have cells. Cells have DNA. I mean, there is no limitation there, okay? Remember, your objective is to create a simulated city. Therefore, in a simulated city, the university object that you are going to create will be just simple. Will only have a few attributes such as capacity and a name, maybe. Did you understand it? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, all right. So here's the uh, graphical representation of it. By the way, my friends, this graphical representation is not in your textbook and it is not made up. There is a formal name of this graphical representation that is called unified modeling language, my friends. Okay. So maybe it's a good idea if you, if I write it here, okay, unified modeling language, and it is abbreviated as UML. You can search Wikipedia for that, okay? What is a unified modeling language? Unified modeling language is basically a language in which you use uh, basically charts like uh, these rectangular shapes. It's like a flow chart, but it's not actually a flow chart, okay? 
uh, and it basically it basically relates to objects that you are going to create in your software with the other objects with several types of relationships. Here we only know of the composition relationship, my friends. We only know of the composition <coughs> relationship. Now, um, how am I going to erase that? Okay. All right. So we only know the composition relationship right now. We should say that a city is a class in which it has two attributes, such as population, which is the size of the population, and the mayor name, okay? Mayor name, which is going to be a string. And it also has two attributes, which are going to be objects from other user-defined classes. It will have a hospital and an university. The hospital that it is going to have is going to be an object generated from the hospital class. So the objects of the hospital class will be assigned as an attribute to the objects to the city class. Similarly, the university attribute of a city will be an object that is generated from the university class. And the university class will have two attributes, such as the campus and the faculty. And by the way, it may have more than one faculty, not just one faculty here. OK, I can create a list of faculties. For example, instead of defining a faculty attribute here, I can define a faculties attribute and the faculties attribute can be a set which contains objects from the faculty class as elements, if you know what I mean, okay? So you can still use the sets and the dictionaries and the lists that we can use in our program. So here we say that a university uh, will have attributes which are objects generated from the campus and faculty classes Therefore, we can say that a university is com composed of a campus and faculty. A city is composed of a hospital and university. By the way, uh, obviously, for a small, for a simulation, uh, city simulation software, I think that the campus and the faculty at, uh, classes are not necessary, but definitely other than the hospitals and the universities here, we should think about airports, we should think about bus stops, and by the way, you need to define the objects uh, as in an object-oriented programming because maybe you can simply uh, put a single hospital in your city, but in your city, you definitely need to put so many bus stops, right? So many bus stops. So therefore, you need to define a bus stop as a single object, a single class. I mean, uh, you need to define a class definition of the bus stop and you can generate so many bus stops in it, which are going to be uh, elements to a certain bus stops attribute, which is going to be written in the form of a set or dictionary. And by the way, you know, there are relationships between the bus stops as well. Okay. Bus stops are connected with each other with bus routes. And bus routes should also be defined uh, as an object. So we need to defined classes for the bus routes. Okay, a class for the bus route. But there are so many bus routes that you can define only a single class. And in this single class, you can just set attributes. So there is no limitation here. The only thing important is, is this, my friends, for your software, is it necessary or not? That's the important part. If it is not necessary, then you shouldn't think about it. If it is necessary, then you should think about it. And basically, in the brainstorming session of an object-oriented program development, I mean, the, as I have told you, that the design part of an object-oriented program is much harder than the coding part, okay? The coding is easy. Teaching the computer how to do it is easy. The important part is this. When you are de develop, designing your object-oriented software, what kind of objects it should have in it? and how these objects are going to be related with each other. Here we are seeing only the composition relationship. As you can see, there's a spatial sign here in a diamond shape. When you see a diamond shape like this, we, that means hospital is going to be an attribute to the city objects, a hospital object, an object generated from the hospital class will be an attribute to the uh, objects generated from the city class. Or in short, in short, a city, has a hospital, a city has a university, a university has a campus, 
a university has a faculty. So composition, my friends, is allowing you to model a simple has an association between objects. So there are so many types of associations, my friends, between objects. A has an association is one of them. And a has an association helps you to uh, code composition relationship between objects. A city has a university, a university has a faculty. And by the way, when you delete the city instance, all other objects that a city is composed of are also deleted. Please do not forget about that. Composition has such a relationship. If you demolish the city, the hospitals in it and the universities in it will be demolished and erased, okay? If you erase a city, the hospital will be erased, the university will be erased, okay? Now, here's the thing. If you erase a city, actually the mayor will still live, right? <laughs> the mayor will still live. Therefore, some associations are not in the form of a composition, okay? Sometimes we have associations. For example, you can develop a mayor class here, which is a human, which is just going to generate a human being, a mayor, okay? And we should say that a city has a mayor, but mayor is also an independent object from the city because when you uh, demolish the city, the mayor will be, not be erased, okay? But the hospitals and the universities and the camps and the faculty inside the university will be erased as city is going to be erased, okay? So we need to understand that. Composition, my friends, it provides flexibility uh, we are not supposed to rewrite the whole city class whenever we want to change the definition in university class. That's a good thing. So let's just say, imagine this situation. Dina, this is a very, very important thing to say about your example. Let's just say a, you want to apply a certain method in the university that you uh, are going to create. Okay. For example, what type of method? Uh, open faculty method, okay, open faculty. We are just going to open any faculty by using the open faculty method in the university object, okay? Or we are just going to say employ uh, or change rector, okay, change rector. We are going to change the rector by using the change rector method, okay? So we are going to define this method in the university class, okay? However, if you, if you do not define city as a composed object, which is composed of hospitals or universities or other kind of objects, then when you want to change a simple rector of a simple university in a very, very large city, then you need to set a method for that in the city class, which is going to make your life harder, okay? This is a very, 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 very simple operation, but changing the rector of a university should be defined as a method in the university class, okay? So if you want to change the rector of the university, you can change it by defining the method here and automatically the university object, which is an attribute to the city object here, will change its rector by working only on that object, okay? And the city will be, will not be affected from that. Only the attribute of the city will be affected from that. Okay? So, uh, if you want to, let's just say, changing vector, you want to delete, delete the change vector method and you want to write another method instead of that. Okay? So, you need to change that method. You need to update that method in the university class and all universities which are going to be as an attribute to the city objects will be subject to that change, my friends, okay? Otherwise, otherwise, if you do not use such a structure, like the composition structure, you need to change your complex code in the city, which is especially defined for a specific university in that class, and that will make your life very hard. In the object-oriented approach, if you want to change any procedure about a certain object, like the university objects, okay? Imagine a procedure has changed about the universities. Then you need to change your code in the university class. The rest of the code will not be affected from now. The rest of the code is not going to be changed, but all universities which are defined as an attribute to the city objects will be subject to that change. Did you understand my point here? 
Yes. Okay, that's the most important part of composition. Okay, by composing my code into different type of classes, which has a has a relationship between each other. Okay, I am just basic. Whenever a procedure is changed as about a certain object in real life, I am applying the change only in that class. Okay, and that is the situation in the real life, right? If in real life a procedure is changed, it is changed about a certain type of object. Okay, so if you try to do this structure, if you try to develop this structure by simply function-oriented programming, then your life is just going to be very hard, okay? Now, we definitely need to use the classes and the methods we need to define in these classes. So these methods should be applicable to all objects which are generated from this class. Whenever we want to change a procedure about these type of objects, we change the method inside the class definition. Now let's speak about the second pillar or the second important concept. By the way, by the way, it is not the second most important concept. It is another important concept. What I mean here is this: if if I want to make an order of the importance between these concepts, inheritance, my friends, comes first. This is the most important pillar of an object-oriented program, okay? The most, and this is the thing, once we understand this is the thing that is going to make our lives very, 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 very easy, okay? It is going to be even more important than composition. Now, please check. We have observed that different object types may have common properties, such as index method works on strings, lists, suppers, and ranges, right? So index method is a, common method which works on objects from string class, objects from list class, objects from tuples class, objects from range class. We can act or we can perform the index method in all of these uh, type of objects, right? Now, here's the thing. Index, if index is a method which works on strings, lists, tuples, and ranges, that means in the class definition of strings and the class definition of lists and class definitions of tuples and class definition of ranges, we need to define index, right? In all of these class definitions, there were, there, I mean, we are thinking about four classes here. For these four classes, in all of the class definitions, we need to define the index method. Actually, this is not the case, okay? The method index is not necessarily to be defined in respective class definitions for each of object types. We can we can define a parent class to strings, lists, tuples, and ranges. What is the common thing between these strings, lists, tuples, and ranges? They are all subscriptable, right? They are all subscriptable objects. We can define a parent class. That parent class will be called, for example, subscriptable object. Okay? Or simply we can say subscriptable. That parent class will have this method defined in it. Okay, the index method will be defined in the parent class. And these four classes will become the ch children of that parent class. And they will be capable of inheriting this method from the parent class. So instead of coding the index method separately in each classes, we can code the index method in the parent class, in the parent class, and all children classes can inherit this method from the parent. Just like in genetics, my friends, just like the genetics, okay? What is uh, used by the parent can also be used by the child, okay? So we are just going to create a new type of relationship between the classes, a parent-parent-child relationship, a parent-child relationship between the classes will be created. And this means what? All of the attributes and methods defined in the parent class will also be inherited by the children classes, okay? In short, inheritance refers to creation of a parent-child association between two different classes so that child class can inherit any or all of the attributes and methods defined in a parent class. This is important. That does not mean that every child must inherit every type of attribute or method from the parent. We can simply say that we want to inherit only what we want to, okay? We want to inherit from the parent only what we want to. It is also possible. But here's the thing. 
here's the thing. If let's just say, ima imagine 10 children, okay, 10 children. Instead of defining separate attributes and methods, which are going to be common for all of these children, because they are the same children from the same parents, okay, the children from the same parents, instead of defining separate methods in their each class definition, we are going to define a single method in the parents' class definition, and we will tell that all of the children classes are going to inherit that method from there. If you change the method in the parent class, that change will be applicable to all children classes and all objects generated from the children. Okay. Now, this is what I'm teaching in this presentation file. I'm sorry, in this presentation page is the idea only, my friends. At this point, you can be you can get a little bit frightened how this is going to work, or you can you may not be imagining at this point. I mean, how this is going to help to us. Just understand the philosophy here. What I am trying to explain here is the philosophy, just understand the philosophy. Imagine there is a parent class and there are several children classes. I am writing a method in the parent class. What I'm saying is this. If I set these classes as children to the parent class, this the objects generated from the children classes will be reaching the method to the, in the parent class, okay? If you remember, so before speaking further, okay, before the practice, if you remember, I have told you this. So let me write it this uh, again using the pen here, okay? So we have a variable name here and we have a method name that is applic uh, applicable on the variable, okay? So when I write such a code in spider, what happens? As I have told you, the interpreter first checks the variable and what type of object we are, have stored in the variable. Okay, it tries to understand what type of object we are talking about here. And it realized that it is from car class, for example. They said that this variable, let's just say car one, is from car class. It identifies it. Then it searches, it searches the method name inside the car classes definition. Okay, inside the car classes definition. And it identifies, yes, there is an increment method defined in the car class, it says, and it applies what that functions definition do in the car class, okay? So basically it searches from, it first identifies what type of object we have here. And then in the class definition of that object, it searches this method and it, it applies that method to that object, half by passing that object as the first argument to replace the self parameter, if you remember, okay? And from the car class, it calls that function, if you remember. Now let's go back, I am, okay, I do not want to have all the writings. So let's, now at this point, I want to explain you something, okay? So let's just say I have applied car one, another method like change engine, change engine. However, change engine is not a method that is defined in my class definition, right? So what it is going to do is if, if the Python interpreter cannot find this method in the class definition of car one, it will search its parents, okay? It will search its parents, whether the parents have such a method, okay? And if the parents, in the parents class definition, if it cannot find it, it will search the parents of parents, okay? Just like that, I mean, I'm just, got, just going to explain this with a funny example. Let's just say you are in debt to your friend, okay? You are in debt to your friend for about $1,000. Dollars. Okay, it's a very large money. Let's make it 1,000 Turkish liras. It is better. Okay, so it's not a big debt. It's funny. 1,000 Turkish liras is just a funny debt. So you have borrowed 1,000 Turkish liras from your friend. And let's just say uh, your friend is looking for the money and your friend is trying to get it from you. Okay, get it from you. But there is no method defined in you to... Payback, like payback. The method, I mean, 
in your class definition, there is no method that is called payback. So what your friend is going to do is to search that payback method in your parents, okay? And in your parents, in your parents' class definition, if there is no payback method, then your friend is just going to search that payback method in the parents of the parents, okay? Did you understand what I mean in philosophy here? Did you understand the philosophy that I want to explain here? My friends? Yes. Okay, I hope you understand it because at this point we are just speaking about the philosophy behind object-oriented programming. We are not just going to practice it at this point. So we are just going to speak a little bit about the inheritance. Now, as an example, university is a class that has a capacity attribute that represents number of students that can be registered to it, right? So every university object that I am going to create must have a capacity, definitely. Whether it's Erzian University that I am creating or another university that I am creating, every university has a capacity attribute, right? And it is just a numerical number. It is just an integer. It's not another object. So the capacity attribute must not be another object, another user-defined object. It is just going to be an integer. And every university must have a method like update capacity because when we are unhappy or uh, we, are, we are not content about the capacity of our university, we, we may think about increasing its capacity, okay? Or sometimes decreasing its capacity, but we usually increase its capacity, okay? So every university must have an update capacity method, which increases or decreases the capacity of the university. So for every university, we need to define a capacity attribute and we need to define an update capacity uh, method, which changes that capacity attribute, right? Now, here's the thing. Imagine the city example again. In this city, I am just going to create objects generated from the university class, but I'm also going to create objects generated from the hospital or the hotel class, right? But here's the thing, hospitals should have a capacity attribute and hospitals should also have an update capacity method in their class definition. A hotel, a hotel must have a capacity attribute too. A hotel must also have an update capacity method defined on it, okay? So this capacity attribute here and the update capacity method is should be common method and common attribute for universities hospitals and hotels, okay? So instead of defining all of these as separate attributes in separate class definitions, what I'm going to do is this. I am going to define a parent class, which is called facility. Facility class will generate facility objects from that, okay? From the facility class, I can generate facilities. Facilities, what are the common things about facilities? Facilities usually have a capacity, which can be changed by the update capacity method, okay? And then the child classes, university, hospital, and hotel, which are going to be set children as to the facility class here, these classes or the objects generated from these classes will be capable of inheriting the capacity and the update capacity, attrib uh, capacity attribute of the facility class and the update capacity method from the facility class. So let me show that picture again in the UML notation, okay? Do not forget about this. I definitely want you to check this from Wikipedia, okay? If you really want to learn the uh, secrets of the uh, object-oriented programming, you definitely need to understand what this language is capable of doing, okay? Please check this later on in uh, Wikipedia, what I'm mentioning here. So unified, again, I'm going to use the uh, unified modeling language, okay? So let me erase that. Okay, clear all my drawings, yes. Again, I'm going to use the unified modeling language and uh, uh, the chart description of what I'm doing here. So I say that a facility is a class which only has a single attribute that is called capacity and which also has a method that is called update capacity on it. So capacity is just a positive integer and update capacity is a method 
which requires an argument, obviously, which, which, to which we need to pass an argument, because when we want to update the capacity, we need to pass a new value here, okay, a new value here. And uh, when we apply the update capacity method to an object generated from the facility class, the capacity attribute should be changed from the facility, okay? Then I define two, three different classes, university class, hotel class, and hospital class. These classes, these three classes are going to help me generate objects of universities, objects of hotels, and objects of hospitals, okay? Now, let's just say in the university class, we have an attribute that is called rector. Rector is just a name, a string, uh, the name of the rector. And I can define a method such as open faculty. Okay, I can open any faculty in my university by using the open faculty method. The hotel will have an attribute such as hotel name. Okay, hotel name like uh, Renaissance. Okay, Renaissance hotel. Because when you make it French, uh, it makes sense for the hotel, right? Uh, it makes more elegant, Renaissance. Okay, hotel name. And set receptionists. Okay, set receptionist is what? It's a method. Okay, it's a method. Set receptionist is a method. And I can set the receptionist uh, to a human being by using this method. Now, hospital. Hospital may have an attribute such as the resident number, the current number of residents right now, how many patients are right now, uh, staying in the hospital. It says an attribute. And I can also change that increment the resident number. Uh, and every time I register a new resident, this resident number can be automatically increased. Or every time I uh, discharge a patient, uh, the resident number can decrease by one. Okay. When, for example, I can define discharge patient method. Discharge patient method. And when I discharge the patient, the patient the registered to the hospital will be discarded and also the resident number attribute will be decreased by one, okay? I can define a method such as schedule operation, okay? Uh, by operation, I mean uh, medical operation, okay? I can schedule operation, which is going to be a method and which is going to schedule, a, for example, operation room from the hospital between certain hours, okay? In a certain period of the activities, and some doctors or nurses inside the operation. So schedule operation will be a method which is just going to relate a patient which requires operation with the other objects from the doctor or nurses class and maybe objects from the uh, operation room class, okay? But let's do not dive in too deep. What I want to state here is this, a capacity attribute must have in all of these objects, right? The university objects, the hotel objects, the hospital objects, they will all have the capacity attribute and they all need to have the update capacity method in it. So instead of writing these attributes and the methods is separately in each of these, because changing the capacity of any university is no different than changing the capacity of an hotel, right? So what you are going to do is this, sorry. What you are going to do is this basically. So let's just say you will create a my hotel object and you will say that update capacity is 500, okay? And that will change the capacity of the hotel to 500. And you can also do it like this. Let's just say you have generated a university object, which is called my university. And you will say that I want to apply the update capacity method on the my university object, and I want to change its capacity to, let's just say, 15,000, okay? So what we are seeing here is this. Basically, when you define this method and the attribute in the parent class, all of the subclasses here, university, hotel, and hospital, are going to inherit this uh, attribute and this method from the parent class. And if you want to change the rules and the procedures about the update capacity method, you only change it here. All these changes that you are going to make will be applicable to university, hotel, and hospital. And that's a very, 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 very good thing, my friends. If you can think cleverly, the common attributes and the methods between all of these three facilities, whether it is a hospital or hotel and universities, 
they should be defined in the parent class, my friends. They should not be defined in individually in all of them. Because if you define these common attributes and the properties that belong to all of these facilities in the facility class, then you are just going to change your code only in at one class definition, okay? In not separate class definitions. By the way, we have university, hotel, and hospital. You can also define another facility here, which is going to be different than university, hotel, and hospital. You can say, for example, nursery, okay? A nursery, it's also a facility. It is like a university, by the way. I mean, it's just like a school, a nursery. And it will also have a capacity and it will have a method to update the capacity, okay? Did you understand what I try to explain here? The idea of inheritance. Yes, no, maybe. Isn't there anybody to speak about this? Okay, let's speak further yes. then. Yes, do you have any question? No, sir, I said yes, but I understood. You are fine, okay. Now, let's speak about a little bit further about the inheritance. What is different than the composition here? Composition, composition try, helps us to create a, has a relationship. We say that a city has a hospital, a city has a university, okay? A city has an hospital, a city has a university, I say. A university has a campus, a university has a faculty. But inheritance creates a, is an association between objects. Okay, is an association. I hope you understand. But uh, let me tell you at this point, uh, because inheritance is a very, very, very clever concept, my friends. Not every time in practice we use inheritance to create an is an association, but let me tell you, if you want to create an easy association between objects, then you can use inheritance, okay? So inheritance, as, as the st sentence depicts here, please be careful, the sentence depicts here, inheritance allows you to model is an association between an object, but you can also use inheritance to model other type of associations too. But at this point, what we have seen in the previous example was uh, creating an is an association, right? A university is a facility. A university is a facility. A hotel is another facility. A hospital is another facility, my friends. Now, here's the thing. A private university is a university, right? But there are some differences between private universities and the universities, okay? For example, for a private university, we can think about what? I mean, what, what is different in private universities? I mean, you need to know, right? Uh, let's speak. Okay, let's see the example. I do not remember. Every private university must also have a foundation of attribute, right? Foundation. Because the pri private universities are opened and supported by foundations, okay? Like the, like Erzian Foundation here, okay? In our university. Every private, but state universities, ordinary universities, they do not have any foundation. So we need to define another child, ch child class to university so that the private university may inherit attributes and methods from the university, but private university may also have individual attributes and methods that it has, okay? So every method or every attribute that a university has must also be obtained or the inherited by a private university, but the private universities may have different attributes which ordinary universities that do not have. And a private university is a university and a university is a facility. Therefore, you can also change the capacity or update the capacity of a private university because private university will inherit it from the parent of the parent here, okay? parent of the parent here. So I'm just going to come to the next example. Now let's speak about another example. As a parent class may have multiple child classes, a child class may as well have multiple parents as well. Okay? So unlikely to genetics and unlikely to general uh, reproduction rules, my friends, you know, in order to reproduce between human beings, we only need two people, okay? A female and male. So a female and male can reproduce and uh, give offsprings, right? Give offsprings uh, as 
new children, new human beings. However, this parent-child relationship is a little bit different in between classes. A, a parent may have multiple children and a child may have multiple parent classes. Okay, multiple, even more than two. Okay. Now, you know, a university is a facility, right? A university is a facility, but you, a university is also a school. A university is also a school. So every type of attribute or method that is applicable to schools must also be applicable to universities. Okay. So a university may inherit attributes and methods from both parent classes, from both facility and both school. For example, let's speak about this. Let's define a school class. And what do we have in schools as attributes? The teaching method, the education level, whether it's a primary school or mid-level school or high school or undergraduate school or graduate school. Okay. Education level is an attribute. Teaching method is an attribute. Okay. There are several types of teach teaching methods. Actually, I do not want to speak about this. This is not a part of the class. Um, but what you usually have seen up to this point is the same type of teaching method in your life. But there are other type of teaching methods, which are a little bit radical to use in different kinds of schools. Uh, now, you see, a university here is a child both to school and the facility. Okay? So, a university may have the capacity attribute inherited from the facility and the update capacity method, which can change that capacity attribute, which is inherited from the facility, but it might also have the teaching methods and the education level uh, attributes inherited from the school, okay? I hope you understand this. Now, the private university is a child to the university, which also has the foundation attribute by itself, a university does not have a foundation attribute, but a private university has a foundation attribute. But it also has the rector and open faculty, a rector attribute and the open faculty method inherited from the university class. It also have, has the capacity and the update capacity, up capacity attribute and the update capacity method inherited from the parent of the parent. And it has the teaching method and the education level attributes, again, from a parent of the parent. Okay. Because a private university is a university, a university is a school, a university is a facility. I hope you understand that relationship that is an association relationship here. Just like the idea here, a hospital class may inherit attributes and methods from both parent classes, facility and healthcare center. Okay? There is a misprint here. Imagine this situation. A, a hospital is a facility. Therefore, it has a capacity and we can change its capacity by the update capacity method. But a hospital is also a healthcare center. And in healthcare centers, we have doctor numbers, the number of doctors employed there. And in healthcare centers, you can employ doctors. So a healthcare center is a class in which we have the number of doctors as an attribute. And we can employ new doctors with the employee doctor method. Therefore, a hospital should inherit this doctor number attribute and the employee doctor uh, method from the healthcare center class, but it also needs to inherit the capacity attribute and the update capacity method from the hospital class and it may uh, from the facility class. And the hospital class may also have its individual attributes and methods, such as the resident number and the schedule operation uh, method. Because, for example, not in every healthcare center we schedule operations, right? There are some healthcare centers like a clinic. In clinics, you do not schedule operations because you can only schedule operations in hospitals. Schedule operation method should only be defined in a hospital. It's not going to be defined in the healthcare center uh, class. And that's it, basically. I hope you understood what I meant here again in philosophy. Is there any question that you will, I mean, before uh, asking that, uh, we are going to talk about, uh, let's just speak about this. Last slide, then I'm going to give you a break, my friends. Inheritance, my friends, promotes the reusability of the code, hence reduces the coding effort. So what do I mean by reusability? So when you change the update capacity method here, all for all objects such as universities or private universities or hotels or hospitals, that update capacity method will be changed. Okay? So basically, you are 
doing what? You are permitting the reusability of the code. So imagine the other situation. Imagine this update capacity method is defined separately in universities and also in private universities and also in hotels and hospitals. Let's just say the update capacity regulation has changed. Okay, your city government, the municipality has changed update capacity. And it has said that from this point on, the facilities in the city will only update their capacity as long as it is greater than 10%. You cannot update your capacity by 5% or 6%. You can only update your capacity if the increase is at least 10%. Let's just say there has been such a regulation. Now, the burden here is this. The update capacity method must basically conform to that rule. And you need to separately change it in every class if this update capacity method is defined separately. However, if this update capacity is defined only here, which is inherited by all facilities here, then you can change that regulation only in this method definition at only one point by changing your whole program at one point only, that change will be applicable to all objects which are considered as facilities, my friend. I hope you understood that example. Inheritance promotes the reusability of the course. It reduces the coding effort. A change in parent class applies to all children. Thus, it suppresses the need for individual changes in child classes. Attributes and methods defined in parent class, those remain standard in all child classes. So the update capacity method is remaining standard in all child classes here. Now, before speaking about customization via inheritance, we are going to have a break. So I am stopping recording uh, now.